In the year 1775, there stood upon the borders of Epping Forest, at a distance of about 12 miles from London, a house of public entertainment called the Maypole, with its overhanging stories, drowsy little panes of glass, and front bulging out and projecting over the pathway. The old house looked as though it were nodding in its sleep. The bricks of which it was built had grown yellow, and discolored like an old man's and the sturdy timbers had decayed like teeth. Now it is the twilight of the day in March, and the wind howls dismally among the bare branches of the trees, rumbles in the wide chimneys, and drives the rain against the windows. Oh, it's all clear at eleven o'clock. Not before and not afterwards. How will you make that up, Mr. Willett? The moon is past the full and she rises at nine. Never you mind about the moon. Solomon Daisy. You let the moon alone and I'll let you alone. No offense, are you? No offense. That's yet. Well, well I thought you gave an order, stranger. That meant no harm. <coughs> Mr. Parks, that's a highwayman, I'll wager. Do you suppose highwaymen don't dress handsomer than that? It's a better business than you think for, Tom Cobb. Highwaymen don't need to be Shabby, you can take my word for it. What house is that which stands a mile or Public house? Not the house, father. He means the great house, the water. Naturally, of course, the old red brick house that stands in its own grounds. What? Uh, the owner's name is Haredale, Mr. Jeffrey Haredale, and we'll gentleman too. I said out of my way coming here and took the footpath that crosses the grounds. She you know lady I saw into the carriage? His daughter? Why, how should I know, honest man? I didn't see a young lady, you know. That's Mr. Hairdale, the daughter. He's a single gentleman. Can't you be quiet? Can't you see this talk as a relish, yonder? Single men have had daughters before now. What do you mean? You come in for cousinly, I know you will. I mean no harm. I ask a few questions, any stranger may, about the inmates of a remarkable house in a neighborhood which is known to me. And you are as aghast and disturbed as if I was not treason against King George. Perhaps you tell me why, sir. I can give you no information on the matter, sir. <clears throat> he has set off to walk to London. His nag all made right in here, all lifted up in our stable. He has given up a good hot supper in our best bed because Miss Haredale has gone to a masquerade up in town and he has set his heart upon seeing her. Silence, sir! What shack you are, Joe? Such an inconsiderate lad. Putting himself forward. When you see there are people more than two or three times your age sitting still in silence and not thinking of saying a word! Why, isn't that the proper time for me to talk? The proper time? The proper time's no time, sir! Ah, to be sure! When I was your age, I never talked. <laughs> I never wanted to talk. I listened and I improved myself. That's what I did. And you find the father a rather tough customer in an argument, Joe, if anybody wants to try and tackle him. No, for the matter of that, Phil, argument is a gift of nature. But nature is gifted a man with the powers of argument, a man has a right to make the best of him. Oh, well, it's all very fine talking, but if you're trying to tell me I'm never to open my mouth. No, lips. sir, you never are. When you spoke to, you speak. When your opinion's wanted, you get it. When your opinion's not wanted, and you're not spoke to, don't you give an opinion, and don't you speak. If you'd asked your questions of a grown-up person, you'd have had some satisfaction and wouldn't have wasted breath. Miss Emma Haredale is Mr. Geoffrey Haredale's niece. Father of the Lord. Oh, he's not alive. And he's not dead. Not dead? Well, not dead in a common sort of way. What do you mean? Oh. That is a Maypole story. It has been these two and twenty years. That story is Solomon Daisy's story. And nobody but Solomon Daisy has ever told it under this roof. Or we'll never shall, that's more. It was Mr. Reuben Haredale, Mr. Jeffrey's elder brother. Come, what day of the month is this? The 19th. Of March! The 19th of March! <sighs> Very <laughs> it was Mr. Reuben Hairdell, Mr. Jeffrey's elder brother, that 22 years ago was owner of the war. This lady was lately dead, and he was left with one child, his daughter Emma, who was then scarcely a year.
after his lady died, finding it lonely light, and went up to London. And finding that place as lonely as this, he came back again to the ward with his little girl, bringing with him besides two women servants, Stuart and a gardener. It happened that night an old gentleman at Chigwell Row died, and I was given the order to go and toll the passing bell at half after 12 o'clock that night. Oh, it was a dreary thing. However, I put a good face upon it as I could, and muffling myself up, started out with light and lantern. Oh, such a night as this, blowing a hurricane and raining heavily and very dark. I got inside of the church. Took the bell rope in my hands. When at that moment there rang not that bell, but another. And a deeper bell too, clanking. It was only for an instant. But I heard it. I listened for a long time. But it rang no more. I ran to bed as fast as my feet could touch the ground. I was up. I was up early next morning after a restless night, and it was that morning that Mr. Reuben Harewell was found murdered in his bedchamber that day. In his hand was a piece of the cord attached to a log outside the roof, which had hung in his room, which had been cut asunder. No doubt had the murder when he seized it. That was the bell I heard. The bureau was found opened, and a cash box, which Mr. Reuben Haredell had brought down that day, which was supposed to contain a large sum of money, was gone. The steward and the gardener were both missing and both suspected, but they were never found, though hunted far and wide. Far enough they might have looked for poor Mr. Rudge, the steward, whose body, scarcely to be recognized by the clothes and the watch and the ring he wore, was found in a piece of water in the grounds, where he had been stabbed with the knife. All the people agreed that he had been sitting up reading in his own room, where there were many traces of blood, before he was fallen upon and killed before his master. Everyone now knew that the gardener was the murderer. Though he's never been heard of from that day to this, he will be. Mark my words. The crime was committed on this day, two and twenty years, on the 19th of March, 1753. Strange story. Oh, 
steal, steal! Is he robbed? Oh, the robber made off that way, did he? All right, it's all right, Barnaby, it's all right. Here, hold the light this way, so could you? Hey, well, oh, oh, Barnaby, this man is not dead, but he's a wound in his side and he's in a baking pan. I know him, I know him! Know him? I... Hey, what else did I? Oh, who are you? For a life, Jenny, he should never go a wooing again. For if he did, some eyes which were dipped out of now is bright dead. Say, when I talk of eyes, it's not somehow. Well, whose eyes are they? If they are angels' eyes, why do they look down here? And see, good men hurt. It's only we can spot the Lord and die! Barnaby, help me put this man into the chaise, and we'll ride home to your home and mother together. Perhaps she can tell me who he is. I can't touch him, he's bloody! Barnaby, if you know this man, for the sake of his life, my boy, help him.
She will go distracted. Why, Miss Hairdell was with her uncle at the masquerade, where she went sorely against her will. What does your blockhead father do when he and Mrs. Rudge have had their heads together, but goes there when he ought to be a bed? And like himself to do so. Very like himself, so your mother said. Mm. However, in a little room, there was a Miss Hairdell sitting alone. I no sooner whisper the matter to Miss Redford than she gives a sort of, a sort of scream and faints away. Check or stop. Ask me a question. 
good man, and what is he to do with you? What riddle is this? It is one that must remain forever as it is. I dare not say more than that. Dare not? Do not press me. This is a secret which, of necessity, I trust to you, as you have ever been good and kind to me, keep it. Any noise were heard above, make some excuse. Say anything but what you really saw, and never let a word of look between us recall this circumstance. Mind, I trust to you. How much I trust you never can conceive. It is a sad thing to have in one minute reason to mistrust a person I have known for so long. An old sweetheart into the bar. Oh, 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 is that Barnaby? Ah, oh, I sure ain't not being teased. How did you get? Well, uh, <laughs> by your shadow. Oh, he's a merry fellow, Dutch shadow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am silly. Now he goes on the floor, and, and, and now behind. And then now he's probably stealing on the, on the dish side, or like that, stuck in whatever right stuff. Why don't you come? Where? Upstairs. Mr. Chester wants you. Stay. <laughs> Where's his shadow? Come, oh, you're a wise man, tell me that! He has changed shadows with a woman. Her <laughs> shadow's always with him, and his with her. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, a lie tonight. 
I was married. For your sake, I can't help the suspicions you have forced upon me, and I'm loath to leave Mr. Edward here. I doubt the safety of this, this roof, and I'm glad he leaves it so soon. <laughs> I bark away, my friend. If there's any wickedness going on, that raven's in it. I'll be sworn.
be hard on us. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> 
This is easily made. Yeah. Come here, friend. You, you love your master's daughter. I do. Have you a right? Not as I know one. Well, if you had now, what would you? Right? Ow, ow, ow. have already begun to grow. I don't know if anyone troubles with their monsters! Company of best men at For their respective parents. Oh, good night, noble captain. Farewell, brave general. Conceited, bragging, empty-headed, oh, young lady, oh, idiot! Face this 
sell. Oh, you're the landlord. Let your service sell. You can give my horse to a stable, can you? And me an early dinner. And a decent room, of which there seems to be no lack in this great mansion. Oh, you can have, sir, anything you please, sir.
You're strange and you're willing to send to me. Where is he? Oh, he's in the great room upstairs, sir. Show the way. Your staircase is dark, I remember. <coughs> Gentlemen, good night. I say I am here. Our meeting head is one of conference and peace. I have come here at your desire. Mm. <coughs> you do me a great deal of honor, head head. I thank you. I will be frank with you. I beg pardon. Will be what? Frank, open, perfectly candid. Don't let me interrupt. Do you drink, my friends? Hmm. You will at least be seated. I will stand. Go on. Well, you have a niece, and I a son. They fall in love and form what the world calls an attachment. The question is. Shall we too, because society calls us enemies, stand aloof and let them rush into each other's arms, when by approaching each other sensibly, we can prevent it and part them? I love my niece. It may sound strangely in your ears, but I love her. Strangely? Not at all, my good friend. I, for as you say, love him. He's an amazingly good fellow, foolish. in his head, independent dislike that you and I might have to being related to each other, and independently of the religious differences between us, I couldn't afford a match of this description. No, no, I couldn't do it. It's impossible. Mark, if any man presumes to think that I would ever entertain remotely the idea of Emma Haraday or favouring the suit of anyone who's akin to you, he laughs. Herdell, on my word, those are exactly my sentiments, only expressed with much more force and power than I would choose. You know my sluggish nature. I <laughs> will restrain the more correspondence with your son and bring off intercourse. I will do it kindly and tenderly if I can. You see the advantage of our having met. We quite understand each other. We quite agree. And we know what course to take. Pray, who have aided them or your son? Who are the go betweens and agents to you now? All the good people hereabouts. The neighborhood in general, I think. That messenger I sent you today, foremost of them all. Indeed. I wrung that from his mother, from whom indeed I chiefly learned how serious the matter had become. I take parley with you on this neutral ground. Well, whose heart, the dignity, the pride, the duty. I would have said by then. I should have expressed to him that we could not possibly afford it, that I have always looked forward to his marrying well, for a genteel provision for myself in the autumn time of life, that there are a great many clamorous dogs to pay. And who must be paid out of his wife's fortune. And break her heart as speedily as possible. Oh, that's entirely his affair. I would for the world interfere with my son, Hedda. Beyond the point. <laughs> Just, we've now wished it difficult to separate these two young people and break off the intercourse. What course do you intend to take? My good fellow, nothing is here. I shall resort to a few little trivial subterfuges for rousing jealousy. And resentment. In short, we are to resort to treachery and lying. Oh no, fine, fine, not lying. Only a little management, a little diplomacy, a little intriguing. That's all. I shall second your endeavours to the utmost of my power. This is the one topic in the whole wide range of human thought on which we both agree. We shall act in concert, but apart. There will be no need, I hope, for us to meet again. Ha! A very coarse animal indeed. A rough brute. Quite a human. Badger. On the morning of the march, it's John Willett's pride, and the latest of his accounts with the second. Finsbury is still in London. And to give it to you, had a canvas bag containing the exact amount, a penny more or less, was the end and object for Jane Joe. What do you mean by pulling up the crocuses in Snowdrop, say, sir? It's only little nose got gate, Father, not on that, I hope. You're a lawyer business, you are, sir. I don't suppose in fitness here for such things as nose gate. Oh, these are going to Mr. Varden's house. And you suppose he buys such things as crocuses? 
come. Father, give me the money in the name of patience. Let me go. Well, there it is. Take care of it. And mind you, don't make too much haste back, but give the mayor a good long rest. Do you mind? I, I mind. She'll need it, heaven knows. And Joe leaped into the saddle and rode away. And the very stalwart, manly horseman he looked. The air spotless to the cloth of the hat and the spring nose gave. All the tokens of the laird of his own, even more interesting object than a vintner or even a locksmith. So indeed it came about, for when he had settled with the vintner, he turned his steps towards the locksmith's house, attracted by the eyes of the blooming Dali Bar. But Joe Willett, or his ghost, which is it? Joe in the flesh, eh? That's hearty. How are all the chamber of company, Joe? Oh, much as usual, sir. They and I agree about as well as ever. Oh, uh, but what have we here? A nosegay? A oh, very poor one, sir. I thought Miss Dolly. Oh, no, not Miss Dolly. Uh, her mother. It did great deal better you give them to her mother, Joe. Would you mind giving them to Mrs. Barton, Joe? Oh, not this, sir. I should be very glad, I'm sure. That's right. It don't matter who has them, does it? Uh, not this, sir. <laughs> Come in. Martha, look what young Mr. Willis brought you. Oh, oh, mate, the cheer with those flowers. Oh, I can't bear the room another minute if they remain. <laughs> Would you mind my putting them out of the window? Oh, please, ma'am. Oh, cheer! Joe 
when it rolled leisurely along his desponding mood, picturing the locksmith's daughter going down long country dances and promenading dreadfully with bold strangers was almost too much to bear. When he heard the tramp of a horse's feet behind him, and looking back, saw a well-mounted gentleman advancing at a smart canter. Joe! Joe Willard! Mr. Edward, it's good to see you out of doors again. Uh, you come as I do, from London, eh? Uh, what doings have been going on today, Joe? Is she as pretty as ever? Mr. Edward, I was a fool to think I ever had a chance of her. She's as far out of my reach as heaven is. Well, I hope that's not altogether beyond it, eh? Uh, are you on the maple, sir? Uh, yes. As I am not quite strong yet, I shall stay there tonight and ride home coolly in the morning. Oh, well, if you're in a particular hurry, you'll bear with the pace of this poor Jane. I'll be happy to accompany you to the morn and hold your horse for you this night, and say you can walk from the maple to back again. Well, then we will keep together, Joe, willingly, and be as good company as may be. And cheer up. Cheer up! Think of the locksmith's daughter with a stout heart, and you shall win her yet. Uh, they presently stopped near the warren, and Edward was mounted and gave his bridle to his companion. He walked with a light step towards the house. He hurried along the terrace walk and darted up a flight of broad steps leading into an old and gloomy hall. Here he paused, but not for long. For as he looked round, Edward! Emma! <laughs> this is well done of you, sir. Turn to my house, unbidden, in secret, like a thief. Leave, sir, and return no more. You have compelled me to this cause, and the fault is yours, not mine. This is neither generous nor honorable, nor the act of a true man, sir, to tamper with the affections of a weak and trusting girl while you shrink in your unworthiness from a guardian and protector and dare not meet the light of day. I forbid you this house and require you to be gone. It is neither generous nor honorable, nor the act of a true man, sir, to play the spy. Your words imply dishonor, and I reject them with the scorn they merit. Please to withdraw. Your presence here is offensive to me and distressful to my niece. Mr. Head, you hold her on whom I have set my every hope and thought, and to purchase one minute's happiness for whom I would gladly lay down my life. Your niece has plighted her faith to me, and I have plighted mine to her. What have I done, sir, that you should hold me in such a light esteem and give me these discourteous words? You have done that, sir, which must be undone. Your title of is not here, which must be cut asunder. Take good heed what I said. Lost. I cancel the between you. I reject you and all your kin and king, all your false, hollow, heartless stock. My words, sir. Words of purpose and meaning, as you will find. Lay them to heart. Lay you then these. Your cold and sullen temper, which chills every breast about you, has forced us to this secret course repugnant to our nature and our wish. I am not a false, a hollow, or a heartless man. You shall not cancel the bond between us. And I will not abandon this pursuit. <laughs> a few words to Joe as he mounted his horse sufficiently explained what had passed. And renewed all that young gentleman's despondency with tenfold aggravation. They rode back to the maypole without exchanging a syllable. And arrived at the door with heavy hearts. Old John was out correctly and said with great importance, Oh, it is comfortable with bed, the best bed, oh, a thorough gentleman, the smilingest, affablest gentleman I ever had to do with. Who was it? Oh, you were the father, sir, your honorable, venerable father. What does he mean? <coughs> Why oh, didn't you know it, sir? Well, bless you, he's been here ever since noon today. Mr. Hairdale and him have been having a nice long talk, and he hasn't been gone but an hour or two. My father, Oh, yes, he told me so, sir. Uh, he's in your own room up yonder, sir. No doubt he can go in. I'm sure he hasn't gone to bed yet. Uh, I beg your pardon, Willard. Joe, I have um, changed my mind, uh, forgotten something, and I must return to London. Day, John Willard's guest sat lingering over his breakfast in his own home. On a broad, finely upholstered chaise of a roomy chamber, Mr. Chester lounged. Very much at his ease. He had exchanged his riding coat for a handsome morning gown, his boots, and his And having gradually forgotten through these means the discomforts of 
an indifferent knight in an early ride was in a perfect state of complacency, indolence, and satisfaction. Are you at leisure for a little conversation, sir? Surely, Ned, I am always at leisure. Have you breakfasted? Three hours ago. At a very early dawn. The truth is that I slept but ill last night and was glad to rise. I know where you were last night from being on the spot indeed, and whom you saw and what your purpose was. Oh, indeed. I am delighted to hear it. You have been wretched, sir. My dear Ned, oblige me with the milk. I saw Miss Anna Hedda last night. <laughs> her uncle in her presence immediately following your interview, and in consequence of it, forbade me the house. For this offense, Ned, I am not accountable. But we must not trifle in this matter. Do not repel me by this undivined indifference. Indifferent? My dear Ned, arrive at 25 or 30 miles, a Maypole dinner, a tete-a-tete -tete with Haredale, a Maypole bed, whether the voluntary endurance of these things looks like indifference, dear Ned, or the excessive anxiety and devotion of a parent. I wish you to consider, sir, in what a cruel situation I am placed, loving this hair tell as I do. My dear boy, you do nothing of the kind. You don't know anything about it. I repeat that I love her. You have interposed upon us. Sir, is it your intent to hold us as son if you can? That is my purpose most undoubtedly. You have to thank me, Ned, for being of good family, for your mother, charming person as she was, had nothing to boast of in that respect. Her father was a wealthy lawyer and wished to marry her into good family. Voila! I was a younger son's younger son, and I married her. She stepped at once into the most polite and best circles, and I stepped into a fortune. Now, my dear Ned, that fortune is among the things that have been. It's gone. It has been gone. How old are you? I always forget. Seven and twenty, sir. And I should say, dear Ned, that its skirts vanished from human knowledge about eighteen or nineteen years ago. You are jesting with me, sir. Not in the slightest degree, I assure you. Within the last four years or so, you perused your studies at a distance. At last you came home. I have found you a handsome, elegant, prepossessing fellow, and I thrust you into the society I can still command. Now, having done that, my dear Ned, I consider that I provide for you in life, and rely upon you doing something to provide for me in return. You must marry well and make the most of yourself. I knew you were embarrassed, sir, but I had no idea we were the beggar wretches you describe. How could I suppose it, bred as I have been, witnessing the life you have always led and the appearance you have always made? As for life I lead, I must lead it, Ned. I must have these little refinements about me in regards to our circumstances. They are desperate. Our debts are very great. And therefore, it more behooves you, as a man of principle and honor, to pay them off as speedily as possible. <laughs> <laughs> the villain's part that I have unconsciously laid, I too in the heart of Emma Hairtel. I would for her sake I had died first. I am glad you've seen it, how perfectly self-evident it is that nothing can be done in that quarter. In a religious point of view, no. How could you ever think of uniting yourself to a cannon? Unless she is amazingly rich. You should be so very Protestant, Ned, coming from a Protestant family as you do. Besides, the very idea of marrying a girl whose father was killed like meat. Good God, Ned, how disagreeable. But I tease you, perhaps. Would you like to be alone? My dear Ned, most willingly. You are a person of great consequence to me, Ned. A vast consequence indeed. God bless you. Of all the dangerous characters that prowl and sculpt in the metropolis, 
There was one man with many struggles and involuntary dream. His name was unknown, and he had not been seen until within about eight days or thereabouts. On the night of his speaker, he was abroad again and traversing the streets. Oh, I've been looking for you many nights. Is the house empty? Answer me! Is there anyone inside? Been lying among the trees by the roadside, 
Maybe when the man came by. What man? The robber. We have waited for him after dark these many nights, and we shall have him. I know him in a thousand, Baba. See here, this is the man. Look.
those guys. But a friend. Stranger! Strangers are not my friends. What do you do there? Objection to the Maypole and old John. 
For otherwise, as it's a fine morning, and Saturday's not a busy day for us, we might have all been gone to the chick room and the chaise and had a happy day of it. Oh, Dolly, lead me to my room. Oh, What's the matter now, Martha? Oh, don't speak to me. If anyone had told me so, I wouldn't have believed it. Oh. And the 
slyest, merriest kind of thing in life. To make one's sweetheart miserable is quite right. But to be made miserable oneself is a little too much. Keeping young ladies in love cannot read their letters forever. In the course of time, the packet was folded up and the answer written. Having done so, Emma suffered darling to depart and in doubt moreover with a pretty little bracelet as a keepsake. Now, you mend your roguish ways, for I know you are fond of Joe Willett at heart. That I stoutly deny! I hope I can do better than that indeed. Their goodbye spoken. Dolly tripped lightly down the stairs and arrived with the dreaded library door. He was about to pass it again on tiptoe. When it's open, come here, girl. If you please, sir. I'm in a hurry. You're just left Emma? Yes, sir. Just this minute. What did you bring here today? Bring here, sir? You can tell me the truth, I am sure. Well then, sir, it was a letter. Mr. Edward Chester, of course. And you are the bearer of the answer. He troubled himself about calls. <coughs> you know that I have put the question to Emma and learned the truth directly. Have you the answer with you? Yes, sir. I have. And you may kill me if you please, sir, but I won't give it up. I'm very sorry, but I won't. I commend your firmness in plain speaking. Rest assured that I have little desire to take your letter as your life. You are a very discreet messenger and a good girl. I have some designs of providing a companion for my niece. But her life is a very lonely one. Would you like that office? You are her oldest friend and the best entitled to it. I should be very glad to be near Miss Emma, of course, and always am. That's very well. That's all I have to say. You are anxious to go. Do not let me detain you. And Dolly did let him. And the words had no sooner passed his lips than she was out of the room, out of the house, and in the fields again. The twilight had come on, and it was quickly growing dusk. As she passed through the gate where the path was narrow, she heard a rustling. Oh, what letter? That I was carrying. 
carrying. I had it in my hand. My price said that either they were taken from me or, or I lost them. I come, I'll house you in the main hall and return to the spot to reckon with the lantern. I'll make a strict search for the letter and waste. I'm sure to find it. They reached the maple bar at last. Where the locks were. And his wife. And old John were, were yet keeping high festival. Is you the same, Father? What do you want him for? To come and look after the ladder and bracelet. Hello there! No! There you are, sleepyhead. Bring that small cudgel of yours and we'll be tied that up and come upon him. What fellow? What fellow? It's well for the likes of you to be snoring your time away in chimney corners when honest men's daughters can cross our quiet meadows without being set upon by footpaths. How many are there? Only one. And uh, what was he like, mistress? About my height? Not, <clears throat> not so tall. His, uh, his dress like any of ours now? He was wrapped in a loose coat, and had his face hidden by a handkerchief. You wouldn't know him then if you saw him. Be like. I should not. I don't wish to see him. I can't bear to think of him. Oh, pray, Mr. Joe, don't look at these things. I entreat you not to go with that man. Not to go with me? Why, well, bless you, mistress, I have a generous heart alive. I love all the ladies, man. Well, if you do, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Such sentiments are more consistent with a benighted Muslim or a wild lionder than with a Spanish Protestant. I'm afraid you've never studied the manual, sir. Never, ma'am. There's no point. I can't read. Mm -hmm. The search was wholly unsuccessful. Joe had groped up and down the path a dozen times. But all in vain. Dolly, quite inconsolable. I wrote a note to Miss Haredale, giving her the same account of it that she had given at the main house. Which Joe had pledged to deliver. Soon the horse was accordingly put in. And the chaise brought round to the door. And Joe was helping Dolly into her seat. Oh, Joe, I was so frightened. So thankful that you came up to rescue me. Yeah, I haven't thanked you enough. And I hope that we'll always be friends for this time for. Oh, we're not just friends, I hope. Well, not enemies, I hope. Well, couldn't we be something much better than either? Good night, if I'm safe. Good night. She would have acted. Take care of that man, and pray, don't trust him. But Hugh was standing close to him. So all she had was a subtle joke to give her head a gentle squeeze. When the shares had gone on for some distance, to turn and wait. As he still lingered on the spot where they had parted. With the tall, dark figure of Hugh beside him. <laughs> Twilight had given place to night's sound of hours, and it was high noon in those walks of the town in which the fashionable world condescended to dwell. And Mr. Chester reclined upon the sofa in his dressing room. I'll go back his writing with and I need you to give it to him. I need you to go in there. What now? You know I want to help. A man, sir, has returned the rider when you lost the other day. Let me see him. And see that he rubs his shoes first. Oh, and bring my coat as well. Yes. 
What else? Well, a kiss. And what else? Nothing. I think, I think there was something else. I have heard a trifle of jewelry spoken of. A mere trifle. Such as a bracelet, for instance. You took that for yourself, my most excellent good friend, and may keep it. I am neither a thief nor a receiver. You're not a receiver. What do you call that, master? I call that quite another thing. Robbery on the king's highway is a very dangerous and ticklish occupation. How's this? Who are the your room? I did you. What are you to know? Oh, fairly neatly worded upon my life. Quite a, a woman's left, full of what people call tenderness and disinterestedness and heart and all that sort of thing. It was directed to my son, and you did quite right to bring it here. Take this for your trouble. If you should come across any other information you might think I'd like to have, bring it here, will you? Your neck is as safe in my hands as though a baby's fingers crossed it. Have a glass. To you, sir. I drink to you. Thank you. By the by, what's your name, my good soul? I know you're called Hugh, your other name. I have no other name. I've always been nothing more. I never knew, nor saw, nor thought about a father. And I was a boy of six when they hung my mother up in Thailand for a couple of thousand men to stare at. They might have let her live, she was poor enough. How very sad. I have no doubt she was an exceedingly fine woman. Out of the two thousand odd, there was a large crowd for his being a woman. I alone had any pity. <coughs> well, good night, master. Good night. And remember, you're safe with me, quite safe. So long as you deserve it, my good fellow. Good night. Bless you. <laughs> and yet, I do not like that having hung his mother. The fellow has a fine eye, and I'm sure she was handsome. <laughs> Here, Pete. Very probably she was coarse. Red nose, perhaps. Clumsy feet. All for the best, no doubt. Thank you. Bring some scent and sprinkle the floor and clean that up. Hmm? A friend desiring a conference immediate. Proud. Burn it when you've read it. Where in the name of the gunpowder plot did you pick up this? <laughs> it's given me by a person waiting at the door, sir. With cloak and dagger. Nearly an apron and a dirty face. Let him in. So I thank you for this condescension. Please excuse the menial office in which I'm engaged and extend your sympathies to one who has entered workings far above his station. You have heard, sir, of G. Varden, locksmith, bell hanger, and repairs neatly executed in town and country. What then? Uh, I'm his apprentice, sir. Simon Tapperton. Your name, sir, is Chester. I suppose. <laughs> and now he comes to business. From what passes on our house, I'm aware, sir, that your son keeps company with young lady against your inclinations. Now, on this account, I invite you. And what I can tell you is that as long as our people go backwards and forwards that jolly old blank hole, you can't help your son keeping company with that young lady by definition. Mr. Tapperton, your wisdom is far beyond your years. Pray, go on. But if an honest, civil, smiling gentleman like yourself will talk but well, ten minutes for our old woman, that's Mrs. Vardman, flatter her up a bit, you will get her over forever. Then her daughter Dolly wouldn't her daughter Dolly wouldn't be allowed to be a go-between from that time forward. Mr. Tabitha, your knowledge of human nature is Well, now I come to the point. So there's a villain in that thing called a monster in human shape that unless you get rid of will marry your son to that woman. He will, sir, for the hatred and malice that he bears to you. If you knew how this chap, this Joseph Willie, comes backwards and forwards to our house, libeling and denouncing and threatening you, 
You hate them worse than I do with such a thing were possible. A little private vengeance in this, Mr. Tappertit. Private vengeance or public sentiment or both combined. Destroy him. Makes that so too. Makes me both say so. Why don't you write to Mrs. Roger and likewise about that villain, Joseph Quidditch, is the ringleader. His plottings and schemes are known to me and his. If you want information on them, apply to us. Put Joseph Willett down, sir. Destroy him. Crush him! And be happy. <laughs> What a curious creature. <laughs> and yet, blunt tools are sometimes found with use where sharper instruments would fail. I fear I may be obliged to make great havoc among these worthy people. A troublesome necessity. I quite feel for them. We now follow in steps on the foot, making the horse cheaper. The widow. And finally, Rodge. The widow's breast was full of care. But your boys get too much without a turn. It's become the long journey. She had quitted the place to which they were travelling directly after the event which had changed her whole existence. Two and twenty years and never had the courage to revisit it. The last time she looked back upon that roof among the trees, she had carried Barnaby in her arms, an infant. The warrior was at the end of their journey. Mr. Haredale was walking in the garden and saw them pass the iron gate and waved them into that room. At last, you must the heart of the old place. I am glad. I often told you you should return. You would be happy here than elsewhere I know. Master Barnaby. Quite well, his home. Thank you, me. Polly put the kettle on, well, on had tea. Hear me, then. It is enough to know that we were both cruelly involved in the calamity which deprived me of an only brother and Emma of a father without being obliged to suppose that you associate us with the author of our joint misfortunes. Associate you with him, sir? Indeed. I almost believe that because your husband was bound by so many ties to my brother Ruben and died in his service and defense, that you have come to connect us with his murder. Alas, you little know my heart, sir. It is natural that you should do so. We are a fall of the house. My dear, dear Mrs. Rowland, well, Pray, bring dear uncle, or say, why do you go out yourself and ask the why? I want to live in express. Nothing but that. I scarcely know how to begin. You will make my mind disordered. You do not speak to strangers. Any advice or assistance that I can give, you know is freely yours. What if I came, sir, to say that I reject your aid from this moment on? You would have a reason for conduct so extraordinary? I can give no reason whatever. I dare not say more than that. Heaven is my witness that I have lived since that time in unchanging devotion and gratitude to this family. And go where I may, I shall preserve those feelings unimpaired. The may alone impel me to take the course which I must take, from which nothing now shall turn me. Do you mean to say that you will resolve voluntarily to resign the annuity we settled on 20 years ago? To leave house, home, and goods and begin life anew? As I am deeply thankful for those alive and dead who have owned this house, I will never again subsist upon their bounty. <laughs> Ask me no more questions, sir. I must leave my home tomorrow. <laughs> my future dwelling must be a secret. <laughs> if my poor boy should have destroyed this way, do not tempt him to disclose it, for if we are hunted, we must fly again. I beseech you and you, dear Mr. Edgar, to trust me if you can and think of me kindly. Every day until death I will pray for and thank you both and trouble you no more. Finally,
a young man of the name of Joseph Willett, sir. Oh, yes, that's he. Now, suppose this Joseph Willett were to aspire to the affections of your charming daughter and were to engage them. It would be like his impudence to death. Think of such a thing! You would not on that count or because of a few tears from your own daughter. Refrain from checking their inclinations in their birth. Thus, I entreat you to refrain your daughter and your husband from any further promotions of Edward's suit to Miss Head. Sir, it would be an honour to serve you in such a secret alliance. Oh, I thank you, madam. You are truly a beautiful servant. Now, if this lovely young lady will show me the door, I will take my leave. Miss Vaughan. I can show you out, sir. <laughs> Me, what a gentleman to think of taking you for Miss Dolly and Dolly for your sister. <laughs> oh, if I were master, wouldn't I be jealous of you? Oh, oh. Biggs, you are a foolish, giddy, light-headed girl whose spirits carry you beyond all bounds, <laughs> and who doesn't mean half of what she says. Chester rode at a tight little pace along the forest road upon his chestnut car. 
in pleasant time, the Naples massive chimneys rose within his view. Ah! Yeah! Oh, here I am, man. Take this valuable animal into the stable. You want to keep your place. You keep such strange servants, John. But your son, why don't you make him useful? Why, oh, yes, for my son, sir. Sir, I know my duty. We want no love making here, unbeknown to parents. Sir, my son is upon his patrol. But I thought I, I saw him in the corner window just this moment. Oh, no doubt you did, sir. He's upon his patrol of honor, sir, not to leave the premises. <laughs> Me and some friends of mine were discussing what was uh, best to prevent his doing anything unpleasant in opposing your desires. And was warned he won't be off his patrol for a pretty long time to come, I can tell you that. <laughs> I thank you, my good soul, for your excellent paternal sympathy and wisdom in this matter. Now, my most excellent good friend, I will take a walk in your glorious countryside. And so he bent his steps towards the water. Dressed in more than his usual elegance, he entered the bounds of Miss Haredale's usual walk. I beg pardon. Do I address Miss Haredale? Yes. Oh, Miss Haredale, I bear a name which is not unknown to you. I am the father of him whom you honour and distinguish above all others. You are not the bearer of any ill news, I hope. No, no, Edward is well. Quite well. It is of him I wish to speak, most certainly. I am sensible that I speak to you at a disadvantage. You have heard me described as cold, calculating, well, I have never, sir. sir, heard you spoken of any harsh or disrespectful terms. You do a great wrong to Edward's nature can leave him capable of any mean or base proceeding. Oh, my sweet young lady, but your uncle it must be. It is not my uncle's nature either. It is not his nature to stab in the dark, nor is it mine to love such deeds. But one more minute, Miss Haredale. I never knew until now the worth of a woman's heart, which boys so lightly win and so lightly fling away. Miss Haredale, you are deceived. You are deceived by your unworthy lover and my unworthy son. Speak plainly, sir. You deceive me or I deceive yourself. I do not believe you. I cannot. Pray, take this letter. It reached my hands by chance and by mistake and should have accounted to you, as I am told, for my son not answering some other note of yours. God forbid, Miss Haredale, that there should be in your gentle rest one causeless ground of quarrel with him. You should know, and you will see, that he was in no fault here. I would, I would, Miss Haredale, it were my task to banish, not increase, those tokens of your belief. Go on, sir, and speak more plainly yet, in justice both to your son and me. Edward seeks to break with you upon a false and most unwarrantable pretense. I have it in his own hand. There lies at the present time on his desk, ready for transmission to you, a letter in which he tells you that our poverty, our poverty, his and mine, refrain him from claiming your hand. A letter, in short, in which he not only jilts you, pardon the word, in favour of the young lady whose slighting treatment first inspired his brief passion for yourself, but affects to make a merit and virtue of the act. What you say be true, he takes much needless trouble, sir, to compass his design. He's very tender of my peace of mind, I quite thank him. The truth of what I tell you, my dear young lady, you will test in the receipt or non-receipt of the letter of which I speak. Hey, what does this mean? Why are you here and why with her? Simplest thing in the world! Ned has written her a letter. A voyage sentimental composition which lies as yet on his desk because he has the heart to send it. I have taken a liberty and prepossessed myself of the contents. I have described them to your niece with a little added colouring and description adapted to our purpose. Her pride and jealousy roused to the utmost with no one to undeceive her and you to confirm me. You will see that their intercourse shall end with her answer. If she were to receive Ned's letter by tomorrow noon, you may date their parting by tomorrow night. No thanks, I beg. I curse the compact as you call it, with my whole heart and soul. I have leagued myself with you, and though I did so with a righteous motive, I hate 
and despise myself. You are war. I am war! Death, Chester. If your blood ran warmer in your veins and there were no restraints upon me, well, it is done. But I am most remorseful for this treachery. I will think of you and your marriage and try to justify myself in such remembrances as having torn asunder Emma and your son at any cost. Our bond is cancelled now, and we may part. <laughs> my scapegoat and my drudge at school. My friend of late days could not hold his mistress when he had won her, and threw me in the way to carry off the prize. I triumph in the past and the present. It may come to that one day, Herr Dale, but not yet. Not yet. Life is pleasant enough to me, and dull and full of heaviness to you. To cross swords with such a man, to indulge his humour upon extremity, would be weak indeed. Accidentally, Mr. Chester returned to the main room and found his horse, which was waiting for him at the door. A joke started out that would get stirred. Well, no, John, come on, him! No more of that, sir. No breaking up patrols. It's time to get away again, I assure you. Let me go, sir! Who wants to get away? You do, sir. You do! You're the boy, sir, who wants to steer up differences between noble gentlemen and their sons, are you? Hey, I... hold your tongue, sir! <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, gentlemen, whether boys are to govern men, or men are to govern boys. I cry too. Very good, a oh, very good expression, Johnny. Very good, Johnny. Well said, Willis. Bravo, sir. I want your support, sir. I'll ask you for it. Well, Joe, I hope you will henceforth learn to your father in all things. You found today he's not one of the sort of men who are to be trifled with. So I would recommend you, poetically speaking, to mind your eye for the future. And I'd recommend you, in return, not to talk to me. Oh, your tongue, sir. I won't, father! These things are hard enough to bear from you, from anyone else. I will bear them no longer. Therefore, I say, Mr. Carr, don't you talk to me. <laughs> Why are you that you're not to be talked to, eh, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> eh? <laughs> Joe? Yeah. Who are you that you're not to be talked <laughs> Indeed. It's a fine night. 
I couldn't go without coming to see you. I hadn't the heart to. Well, I am more sorry than I can tell that you should have taken so much trouble. Such a long way, and you must have such a great deal to do. Is this all you say? Oh. Good gracious, man. What did you expect? Joe had little experience in love affairs. He had buoyed himself up all day with the innocent idea that you would certainly say, or, or, why did you go, or, why did you go, or some little encouragement of the sort. He even entertained the idea that she might burst into tears, throw herself into his arms, or collapse in a fainting fit without previous word or sign. But instead, goodbye. Have you? Poor Ned. I told you last night what would happen. May I ask 
history for the Nutcracker. She has been most treacherously deceived. I never will believe that the knowledge of my real position, given her by myself, has worked to this change. But though our contract is at an end, I never will believe that any sordid motive or her own unbiased will has led her to this course. Never. The lady has done what is very natural and proper, and what I predicted she would do. The lady thought you rich, and she found you poor. People marry to better their worldly condition and improve their appearances. It is a matter of house and furniture, of servants and so forth. The young lady being poor, and you being poor also, there is the end of the matter. I drink her health in this glass, and respect and honor her for her amazing good sense. It is a lesson to you, Nick. It is a lesson by which I hope I may never profit, and if years of experience in present Don't stay on the mark. On men, with whom the world in its hypocrisy has spoiled, heaven keep me from its knowledge. Come, sir. We've had enough of this. Remember, if you please, your interests, your duty, your filial affections, your moral obligations, and all that sort of thing. Or you will repent it. I shall never repent the preservation of my self-respect, sir. I will not sacrifice it at your bidding, and I will not pursue the track which you would have me take, Edward. My father had a son who, being a fool like you, disinherited hers one morning after breakfast. I remember I was eating muffins at the time with Monday. <laughs> It is a sad circumstance when a father feels it necessary to resort to such strong measures. It is. It is a sad when a son, proffering him his love and duty, finds himself repelled at every turn and forced to disobey. Dear father, let us between us, not in terms but truth, hear what I have to say. As I anticipate what it is, Edward. I decline. If you intend to mar my plans for your establishment in life and the preservation of the gentility in which this family has so long sustained, if, in short, you are resolved to take your own course, then you must take it, and my curse with it. Beware, sir, what you do. It is quite impossible that we can continue upon such terms. The servant will show you to the door. Go, sir, since you have no moral sense remaining and go to the devil at my express desire. Good day. Peek, that gentleman who has just gone out. I beg your pardon, sir.
who unfortunately we have to say goodbye to. They had served their time with grace and beauty at Wright State University. And so we'd like to give the final bow to Kelly Brumbach, Stephanie Tucker, and Greg Mountain.